This is American Government, Wednesday, August 26th, 2020. This is our third discussion of the Declaration of Independence. I've scheduled one more, and I've kind of moved the material around since I didn't get to all the material on Monday. Um, so originally, uh, I was going to finish up with the Declaration's core teachings today, and I will do that. But what I pushed to Friday is um, is the commentaries on the Declaration, or to remind you of how I structured this discussion. On Friday, we looked, we started, again, the general movement is from the outside in and back outside. From outside in means from the historical circumstances that led to the revolution and the Declaration, and then ultimately looking at the Declaration as a document, its structure, some issues of its language, and then to go deep inside and examine its core principles or teachings about nature, which was what we did on Monday, human nature, that's what we did not finish on Monday, we'll finish that today, and government. Those are the, of the five propositions in the second paragraph, they, they uh, uh, all together, they sum up three core teachings. The Declaration is a, it, is a teaching about nature overall and what nature is. It rests its authority on what human beings, using their natural powers, can see about their own nature and the natural world around it. Just to make sure, I, as I summed up, while I don't think it's it's a denominational doc, doc, uh, document or, or or even a religious one per se, it is not anti-religious either. It is open to it, which is I think how most Americans from the beginning have experiment ha, have experienced their core principles. You hear a very common phrase in American political life and American discourse: "Our God-given rights." Well, the support for that language is the Declaration itself. But when you dig deep, again, remember, the Declaration is addressed to all human beings, the third verb in the first paragraph. Therefore, the presumption is, it is truths can be self-evidently knowable by all human beings. Therefore, it can't be confined to a denomination, or a race, or an ethnicity, or a class. Um, so, uh, um, let me, and so the other thing we did on Monday was, was try to understand what a self-evident truth is. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. So our journey through the Declaration will then take us back outwards, back into American history as it flows from the Declaration and what the Declaration reveals about American history and how different commentators have understood its teachers. I picked four uh, um, authors from the um, a Nichols Reader, and that is one is Lincoln Douglas. It's the first Lincoln selection in the Reader. And it's actually from the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Um, and uh, the reason I, I like this is it really summarizes remarkably the debate about the Declaration and its place in American life uh, as it emerged in the first truly great crisis. Well, it wasn't the first crisis in American life. We'll, we'll see there were plenty of crises before the Civil War. But uh, as Plato suggests, uh, there's no crisis in a nation's life worse than a Civil War where the nation is torn apart, where the political existence unravels in mutual hatreds. So um, the second commentator is Martin Diamond, who was a professor of mine at Northern Illinois University, along with Mary Nichols, by the way, and when David Nichols, her husband, was my friend there, and they got married. Um, but uh, Diamond was a political scientist, and in one of his great lectures given during the Bicentennial of the Declaration, he talks about the meaning of uh, liberty. So in a way, you're going to see Lincoln and Douglas are debating about equality, which is natural in a debate about slavery. Diamond is trying to talk about how the Declaration's teaching about liberty leads to American political life and institutions and beyond it. President Obama, in his second inaugural, is going to argue that the Declaration of Independence is the eternal source of the unfolding of American political life. And therefore, you can't have America without the Declaration. And Kurt Vonnegut, great science fiction writer, in this short story, examines uh, how two of the main ideas of the Declaration about human beings, that they are equal and that they have rights. You're going to see the question of liberty and rights and equality, all of these terms sort of blend together. 
they, they are complex and they are often reflections of each other. But what Vonnegut shows is that uh, the Declaration's teaching tends to emerge in a twofold concern, which you've already seen. A concern that somehow American life should represent the equality of the Declaration, and at the same time that Americans should be free in some essential way based on the Declaration. And you'll see there is a certain sense in which all the great ideas of the Declaration and, and their relevance for life can be uh, come down to a, uh, a, an embrace of the idea that some human beings are somehow equal and they are free. And it will turn out those two ideas are not necessarily identical to each other. We tend to think that um, perhaps because we're optimistic as Americans that you can have everything in political life. Vonnegut suggests, by the way, that when you push these two ideas, equality and freedom, to their extreme, there you may reveal a certain tension between them. And that's in his great short story, Harrison Bergeron. That's for Friday. Okay, so let me remind you uh, that we, we, we talked about the meaning of a self-evident truth. A self-evident truth is uh, uh, a fact or aspect of uh, the human condition which uh, po possesses the internal confidence and observational, the observability of a mathematical truth, but a truth so simple that it's once you see its internal terms, you see it immediately. And practically speaking, as we saw, that's almost as if... E a, a common sense truth about the human condition that even a child can see. Um, it's 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 a it's a based on reason and observation, but again, its terms are so clear that any uh, human being with minimal intelligence should be able to see it. Now, if you hold that definition in mind, that's the test I want to meet as we move through the rest of the Declaration's teachings. That is to say, not only do I want you to understand those teachings. What does the Declaration say about human beings? And what does the Declaration say about government? By the time this definition, this discussion is, is through, you should be able to see the statements, the principles of the Declaration as self-evident truths. Now, in order to help you see that, you'll see that that will condition how I define what a right is and how we see what equality is. So again, the measuring standard of the success of this lecture or my presentation of the Declaration's ideas is, is that when you see what they are, those teachings, you will see them as a self-evident truth about yourself, about human beings, and the world we live in. Okay, so this is the second great core teaching of the Declaration returning to human nature. And as we saw that the second paragraph of the Declaration is the one that contains its main ideas. We hold these truths to be self-evident that what? One, all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. As the tensions within American life began to um, unfold, especially the greatest tension embraced in the framing between freedom and, uh, and slavery, or the embrace of slavery, um, obviously Americans began to reflect on, on what equality means. And as we'll see in some ways, as, as in the South especially, thoughtful people like John C. Calhoun came to the conclusion that the Declaration's core statement about human beings was not true, that human beings are obviously not equal. Now, setting aside the context of that debate uh, about slaves, let's look at the human condition. It would seem as if on first glance, it is simply not true that human beings are equal. Uh, for instance, I just... Uh, bought these $800 glasses for the first time in my life. I've had good vision all my life, and it's true around my 40s, which seems like 300 years ago, I did need, start to need reading glasses. But as it turns out, now I need permanent glasses, and here's what that means. I don't see as well as somebody that doesn't need glasses. In fact, I think the statistic is that 52% of the population in America require glasses. Clearly, for instance, when it comes to natural powers, uh, we're not always equal. Some people are faster, smarter, um, uh, see better, uh, stronger. So it would seem at first glance, at first glance, that the statement that all human beings are equal uh, would not necessarily be a self-evident truth. Of course, as you will see, it turns on 
what you mean by that equality and in what sense human beings are equal. So if you're looking at the notes, first, there is a certain sense in which the statement that human beings are equal is meant as a general statement that when you take one human being and compare it to another human being, like one lion to another lion, yes, there are differences of degree, but essentially within a species created by nature, the individuals of that species roughly have the, the, the same constitution, the same construction, the same powers. Um, that seems to be what the originators of the idea of rights and the doctrines of human equality. I mentioned that these are philosophic doctrines, and indeed it was modern philosophers. Um, Thomas Hobbes in 1651, we'll come back to that when we talk about the definition of a right, and John Locke in 1688, and generally speaking, the language of human beings being equal comes from the modern philosophers, and in some ways they provi provide the framework, the enlightenment, and generally speaking in this period of history, from about 1650 to 1800, our country was born in, in the enlightenment, and there is a certain sense in which these ideas are part of the scientific political and cultural enlightenment of humanity as it unfolded during that time. So, generally speaking, the first understanding is that human beings are equal in that sense. Now, they are primarily equal, and we'll see this is where the concept of equality begins to bump into or overlap with the concept of rights. As we're going to see, there is a certain sense in which uh, human beings are equal in that they possess certain rights and possess those rights equally. So when we turn to the formal definition of a right, you'll see that it also both embraces freedom and equality. All right. Now, one way to understand natural equality as the Declaration uh, understands it is to compare it or look at a natural inequality. And the most useful inequality that helps to understand the Declaration's teaching about human equality is the inequality between adults and children. All of you uh, were children at one time. And what's interesting about college students, traditional college students in the age of 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, or today now 40, just kidding, um, is you know, you're in this uncomfortable stage where you still possess certain aspects of childhood. You're not a complete natural adult, but you're almost there. Uh, and, and you can tell that in the tension between your parents granting you a credit card and trying to put use restrictions on the use of your credit card. The reason that it's easier to come into conflict with your parents about how to live your life is you are now on the brink of natural completion of your adulthood. And as you're going to see, that means you want to run your own life. And, and in some ways, that natural inequality, here's what that means. A child is clearly an incomplete human being, an, an incomplete adult, or an incomplete human being. Now, the core powers, and this is kind of an Aristotelian thought, but the great, the great philosophers of the modern world thought this too, that that what you see in a child is a potential adult, and and that different thinkers in different societies locate the different points of unfolding of the different kinds of human potentials. Um, most philosophers and most traditions around the world say that the beginning of a child's ability to reason for him or herself is about between five to seven. Um, uh, for instance, in the Catholic tradition, that's when you become responsible for confession and that kind of stuff. It's sometimes called the age of reason. But as we saw, even very young children can at least possess minimal reason. But there's no doubt, I think, for anyone's mind that, that you couldn't put a five-year-old um, uh, at, at the head of a corporation or even the head of a family. And so what that here's what that means in terms of rule, the inequality. If children don't possess the full range of natural powers yet, they possess them potentially, but not actually, to rule themselves, then nature provides a solution to that. It provides parents. It doesn't always provide good parents, but, um, but at least you could say the natural function of a parent is to rule an incomplete child until nature completes the building or the unfolding of those powers. So the inequality of abilities, especially the inequality of reason, leads to the rightness of parents ruling over children. But that rule of one human being over another is based on a natural inequality. What happens to children? They grow up and they can beat their parents up after all those years of being beaten by their parents. I'm just kidding. What that means, of course, is that, is that the inequality of powers as the child 
grows disappears. And so by the time you get to a child equal in power to his parents, that's expressed in the natural urge to rule his or her own life. So in some ways, it helps to understand equality when you look at a true natural inequality. Now, the differences in terms of smartness, uh, vision acuity, strength, speed, those may give you a certain advantage as both Hobbes and Locke, Thomas Hobbes and Locke, John Locke say. But when push comes to shove, the, the level of powers and abilities between one human being and another is roughly equal, and chance tends to fill out the rest. So it's not to say that it's not a natural advantage to be stronger than, or more beautiful than another human being, but that doesn't give you in the, in the capacity to live in the natural world that much of, a, of an advantage. All right, so let's then turn to the, probably the deeper sense in which human beings are equal, and that is their possession of natural rights. Remember, the word nature comes from the word Natus, natura, the things that are born. Uh, so obviously, when you when you say nature grants you rights, or uh, that means that you, the rights we're about to talk about and come from are in you by nature, by birth, by your natural construction. And um, and, and and as you're going to see, uh, that doesn't mean that every culture and every society and every family and every parent sees that nature. An example I, I use from time to time is in pre-revolutionary China, around 1911 is when the first Chinese modern revolutionary was. Right? There was a custom in China called foot binding, where um, uh, uh, especially among aristocratic women, you would bind their feet as infants so that as the body grew, their feet would remain stubbled and incapacitated, which was understood to be a sign of grace and beauty. Now, the way that I think the authors of the Declaration would understand that is, is here you have a culture that takes a human potential and actually frustrates it. It turns it off. And as Aristotle would say, if you don't use a natural potential, you lose it. And in some ways, that's exactly what certain cultures do to human beings, according to the authors of the Declaration. Remember, the standards erected here are underneath, they would argue, are relevant to all human beings. And that means that some cultures, some political societies, are better at doing what government is supposed to do than others. Uh, and as we're going to see when we turn to government later today, that's exactly how you measure whether a government is good or bad, whether or not it actually functions in such a way so that the powers and needs put in you by nature are actually secured or provided by that government. Okay, so uh, as, I'll, as I said, you can understand the teaching of equality is a broad kind of natural range of powers found in every age adult, but perhaps the Declaration's teaching is best understood as a kind of a formal statement that human beings are equal in that they possess certain fundamental rights equally. Now, if, I'm, if I've constructed this discussion properly, by the time we finish with a definition of right, you should see what a right is and why it is a self-evident truth that human beings have them and why it is a self-evident truth that they have them equally. So the definition, and this I put in my notes that this is Polvordian. It's wonderful to see your name turned into an adjective. I can imagine what Polvordian might really mean when you're trying to describe a person's behavior. But at any rate, if you look in the middle of the front page, this is my formal definition of a right. It's easier to see it graphically. Uh, so uh, uh, you have to imagine it as I'm speaking about it. It contains three nouns, uh, and, and, and it contains a set of adjectives that describes each of those nouns. First, I'll read the definition. And again, this definition pretty much comes from the great source of, uh, of modern thought, and especially, specifically, the concept of natural rights, which is now the foundation of all modern politics. Every, every one of the nations in the, in the United Nations subscribes in the UN Charter to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, we know that not every government around the world respects or secures rights. Some are, and perhaps most are in some ways, abusive of rights or failed to secure those rights. But nevertheless, if you're a modern nation, technically you subscribe to the idea that human beings have rights and the purpose of government is to secure those rights. That's embodied in the Universal Declaration of Rights, which is the fundamental uh, charter of the UN. So uh, remember, you could say the history of modern politics 
is is a kind of a a a, a, a road a a, a a development from the thought of modern philosophers in the 16 and 1700s, first embodied in the Declaration of Independence in 1776 in this country, in 1789 in the French Revolution, in the Declaration of the Rights of Man, and then as the, the Enlightenment spread throughout the Western world, became the the rhetorical foundation of all government in the modern world. So um, this definition of a human right was actually formulated first by the political philosopher Thomas Hobbes in his great work on political philosophy, The Leviathan, published in 1651 in the middle of the English Civil War. So this is my understanding or formulation because I've been teaching this material for a long time. So I, I've kind of gotten a sense of how to unfold it or unpack it for people who are thinking about it deeply for the first time. So what is a right? I'm going to read the definition, and then I'm going to go back. And in fact, I'm going to do it as I like to say, bass backwards. I'm going to read the definition, which reads coherently. Then we'll unpack it by starting at the end and moving towards the beginning. What is a right? A right is the equal natural freedom. That's the first noun to use our, and I'm going to put an adjective here, which I've already explained to some degree, are roughly, in parentheses, equal natural powers to obtain our equal natural needs, as revealed to us by our natural passions for our needs. Um, so, as I said, this is my definition of formulation, but it's based upon the concept of rights as it emerged in the works of the philosophers, and as it became embodied in the Declaration. So let's unpack this definition. The last noun is equal natural passions or needs. Here's what that means. The way that you were born into this world as nature constructed you, constructed you with certain needs. Food, uh, 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 air, breathing, nutrition, uh, even for that matter, uh, 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 love and affection as a mammal. It turns out nature constructs every natural being with certain natural needs. Where it's the source of those needs in that being's nature. So, for instance, no human being can live naturally without food, without air, without water, perhaps without love. Um, now, it's a good question and probably one of the deepest questions of modern life, whether or not human beings can live without cars or chocolate or cell phones. There wasn't what you have to remember here is there's no question as we see and this is implicit in the doctrine of the declaration is that we don't live in the way that nature made us well when we come back to the question of why nat not rights are insecure we'll see this we live in society and people acquire a different kind of layer over their natural needs so that sometimes a society can distort or create needs that are actually not natural they have to be grounded in some natural need like for instance there's no natural need for chocolate bars I think, um, but you can tell that like, or for ice cream or for money, or for all kinds of things, um, you can acquire exaggerated artificial needs that may in fact obscure or even undermine your natural needs. We are talking about natural needs. Now, here's the point. Once you see what a natural need is, food and everything, ask yourself this question. When it comes to staying alive, which is what nature makes us want to do, does one human being need food any more than another? Another human being may want more food and they may eat more food, and, but that's not the point. Once you, once you establish a natural need, whether it's food or water or, or, or whatever, then you see that every being that has that need in that species anyway has it equally. No human being needs food more than another human being needs air. If you take Add it away from any human being, you'll, the human being will die. So you'd have to say, the moment that you see our fundamental needs as natural beings, you self-evidently see, not as a, the conclusion of a long process of reason, but the moment you grasp those needs, you see they are equal in all of us. My uh, pious and somewhat vulgar aunt uh, used to say, your blank doesn't smell any better than mine. That's a kind of a crude way of saying this, that every human being as a natural animal uh, is 
it has needs equal to each other's. That's the first part. Let me read the definition again and come to the second term. Our equal natural freedom to use our equal natural powers to obtain our equal natural needs. If nature creates certain needs in you and they are they are equal to everyone else, uh, you could say this. It is right, according to nature, if you have a natural need for food or water or air. Nature has constructed you that way. Therefore, it is right for you to have those things. Nature makes all the creatures it um, it creates or it is it it, it develops um, uh, with certain powers to obtain those natural needs. So every different species in nature has a different range of natural powers or means to obtain the ends of its needs, and we get back to human equality. Um, every lion has a certain set of powers: claws, speed. Um, uh, uh, and if you're well drawn in animated cartoons, you have everything you need. What I mean is, is think about this. I, I, here's a nice thing: snakes and mice are both created by nature. They both have a need to stay alive, and and each being each species, each snake has an equal need to stay alive. Is equal snake, each snake, and each mouse does. And in fact, each snake has the need to remain alive, just like a mouse does. To each one of these beings, nature gives different powers. To obtain that life, it gives the snakes fangs and 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 acute smell, and and the ability to move quickly. To mice, uh, it gives um, speed, agility, um, and uh, and um, and uh, cuteness. Um, so it may seem that in in the in, in the movie The Lion King, I remember in the Circle of Life, uh, Mufasa explains to Simba that. You know the antelopes eat the grass, and 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 the lions eat the antelopes, and then the lions die and become grass, and it's the circle of life. And in, in that, you would say, well, don't the lions come out a little better than the antelopes? Well, no, as it turns out, because lions can have claws and strength, and they can catch antelopes, but antelopes also are remarkably fast. And you'd have to say that in, in the scheme of things, it evens out. So every natural being has needs which are natural and therefore equal to every other being. They have natural powers to obtain those needs, which are roughly equal to every other being in its species. And here's the point then. If, now let's confine ourselves to human beings. If every human being has the same fundamental needs, which are natural and equal to each other, and has the same fundamental powers and abilities, with some differences, we already talked about that, but you have to say this. When it comes to living its natural life, no human being is superior or inferior to any other uh, adult human being in terms of using those powers to obtain its needs. Therefore, if every human adult being is naturally equal in his powers to obtain the things that nature makes you need, then every human being is naturally and equally free to use those powers to obtain or remain alive. So if you think about it, you can see how it is a self-evident truth that if you have needs by nature, which are equal, and powers to obtain those needs, which are equal, then every human being is equally free. Strictly speaking, then, here's what this means. You are your own natural ruler. If you are roughly equal to every other human being, no human being, whether it's King George the Third, or the Pharaoh, or the Emperor, or the Pope, or whatever, by nature, no human being naturally rules you. You are naturally free and equal. So if you think about it, what I've tried to show is when you grasp what a right is, the equal natural freedom to use our equal natural powers, to use our equal to obtain our equal natural needs. I, I, it's not that I couldn't think of new words to describe those things. I'm trying to make the point that when you see our needs, our ability, our powers, and our freedom, you'll see that all three of those critical aspects of our nature are natural, and because they are natural, they are also equal. 
And therefore, you could say that the Declaration's teaching about human beings is a self-evident truth. Once you grasp what a human being is, you see that we are essentially equal in the critical respects of our powers, of our needs, our powers, and our freedom. And here's there where we come to the idea of the state of nature. If no human being naturally rules over another human being, then by definition, every human being is his or her own ruler. And that's why, uh, in this understanding of human beings, it is considered to be our state of nature that we do not have government. Because in our state of nature, we would have everything that nature puts into us. But if nature makes each one of us capable of ruling ourselves equally, then no one, again, I'm repeating myself, no one is our natural superior ruler. There goes the theory of the divine right of kings. There goes the theory of aristocracy. Human equality, as it emerges in the Declaration, is undermined, is the revolutionary teaching that shows that King George does not have a right to rule us if we do not think that rule is for our good. So, um, this then leads to the next question, which you're going to see leads to the Declaration's third great teaching, government. Remember, the language of the second paragraph says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Now you understand what that means, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and property. By the way, those three rights, even as Jefferson changed the Lockean triad of life, liberty, and property, because if you think about it, our liberty is a means to our life, and our property, the things that we acquire, are the means to uh, our liberty to preserve our life. The, those three rights, life, liberty, and property, which survive in the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution, as you'll see, and the Fourteenth Amendment to the Constitution, the Due Process Clause, as it's called, Again, as Wilson points out, when Jefferson drafted the Declaration, he changed property to pursuit of happiness. That doesn't mean, by the way, that, that Jefferson and the founders didn't care about property. They thought it was a critical natural right. But again, you have to see these three rights are in order. It's not random. First comes your right to life, then comes your right to liberty to preserve that life, and then the right to the equipment or happiness it takes as a means to that liberty to preserve that life. So. Uh, the next line in the Declaration says, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Now, uh, as I said on Monday, here you have to learn to ask the question that you're not used to asking. Nature grants us rights, but they're not secure without government. Humans have to invent something to bring security to those natural rights. Why? Think about it. Uh, and this is why I try to describe it. Um, if government, uh, if if we are all equal in our right to rule ourselves, that means we're all like little independent countries by nature. So if you think about it, take human beings, put them in a situation in which there's no common rule or authority over them. Each one is absolutely free to do what he or she wants and uh, and also acting on the needs that nature gives us. What do you get when you have uh, absolutely needful human beings with absolutely no restraints on their actions? You get rush hour in New York is what you get. Oh. Uh, but yes, you do. So in a sense, you get chaos. It turns out that our naturally unlimited freedom, because we have no natural rulers except our parents, uh, but when we grow up and become like them, they cease to be our natural rulers. Um so in a situation where human beings have no rule over them and their freedom is unlimited, it turns out that very freedom, those very rights become destructive. So as you're going to see, uh, it turns out that, that human beings have to invent a supplement to our natural condition called government. The analogy I use in the notes is, think about this. We have a natural need for comfort and safety from the weather and everything. So... Uh, in order to fulfill those natural needs, we create an artificial thing called a house. What is a house? It's an artificial means to secure our natural needs, such as a shelter, etc., and comfort. So the Declaration's teaching is government is not natural to human beings. It's artificial. It has to be constructed. And as you're going to see, um, uh, that's how government comes into being. How it comes into being, what's it made of, and, and how that happens, as you're going to see, is uh, supplied by the 
declarations, other statements in that uh, paragraph. So um, why are our rights insecure? I've already suggested it's because of our un unlimited freedom. So you'd have to say that in the world imagined by the declaration, there are three potential sources of insecurity of our rights. The first and most obvious one is other human beings. I try to make my students imagine if you were driving at three in the morning uh, uh, on I-26 down to Columbia from Spartanburg and your car breaks down. Um, when you're there all by yourself as nature creates you, you could say, well, fine, I'm fine. I'm on my own. Yet if you saw headlights coming down the street at three, uh, the interstate at 3 a.m., you probably would feel a little anxiety because you would feel defenseless. So in a way, you could say the first major source of insecurity of our rights as human beings is from other human beings. When humans have no one's straights, no property lines, no way to enforce your security of your safety and everything, people be, tend to become abusive of other people's rights. And you'd have to say this is the minimum understanding of insecurity. Probably that tradition in our government where it says government should be kept to a minimum of just like police and courts and armies, generally libertarian, uh, would agree. Everyone seems to agree that if there's no common rule over us, no way to enforce of boundaries between our freedoms, then uh, then our major th source of, of, of threat to our rights is from other human beings. If you've ever been a sibling in the backseat of a car, you know that your brothers and sisters are your major source of insecurity of your enjoying the back seat ride. So uh, if you think about it, that's why we need to construct government. We draw limits to our freedoms, as you'll see, and the government enforces those limits and protects us from other people. But nature also uh, itself uh, seems to sometimes threaten our rights. And uh, in my notes, I say, have you ever heard of earthquakes? hurricanes, floods, plagues, COVID-19. So on one level, nature creates us and bountifully gives us uh, our needs and things to supply those needs with. But the chance that nature uh, also surrounds us with means that oftentimes it's not from another human being that our rights are taken away, you might say, the structure of nature itself. So on one level, you can see why some people would argue that the purpose of government is like flood insurance or FEMA or something like that. So uh, it turns out that some people argue that government should be more expansive than just the minimal things that libertarians want. Um, uh, even, for instance, including certain things that are built into our nature, like old age and illness. And if you think about it, then there's one other threat to our rights, our security for rights, and that's ourselves. Aren't you sometimes your worst enemy? And as you're going to see, the fact that we ourselves, through, say, destructive habits, bad choices, we can actually undermine and destroy our own lives. I mentioned many times that my beloved niece um, committed suicide at the age of 38. And in some ways, um, you could say that in most societies, suicide itself, uh, the government tries to protect that. Whom is the government protecting your right to life from? from you. And all kinds of regulations come from that idea. Seatbelt laws. Uh, 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 don't people ride motorcycles? Probably one of the worst inventions in human history. I must say, I can understand how houses got invented. I understand how stoves got invented. I even understand how cell phones got invented. But what human being ever got it in their head that it was a good idea to get onto something that goes 90 miles an hour with no protection around you? Anyway, so, uh, so uh, what about Drug laws. Drug laws are intended to protect you against yourself. So if you think about it, our rights are insecure because of aspects of our natural condition. Nature grants us rights and grants them equally. That doesn't mean that in the enjoyment or security of those rights uh, that we are all equal. And so as you're going to see, the Declaration says human beings then have to create something in addition to their natures. They have to create a structure, an artificial structure which gives to them or secures for them what nature doesn't from other people, sometimes from larger conditions, and even from themselves. As I said on Monday, all the debates in American and modern politics um, uh, derive from uh, what government should be doing for us, derives from what kind of natural insecurity um, you think is most essential. 
And that's why there can be very wide differences of opinion about the kinds of policies government should adopt. In my example in the notes, by the way, what about laws? What about cigarettes? Uh, the government clearly doesn't want you to smoke cigarettes because they're bad for you. Uh, and uh, and you could say that that uh, we're almost on the brink of turning cigarettes into what, uh, say, potent drugs were. Um, that we're almost on the brink of a society as telling people that they can't smoke. Uh, 50 years ago, that would have been unthinkable. But as you're going to see, people's understanding of these things changes over time, too. I'm not always saying for the better either. So um, we have to create this artificial thing for government to supplant our natural condition. Um, so um, what is it made of? Government, as you're going to see, when I went back to my definition of institution or constitution last week, um, the main stuff of government, it's people, of course, but the main stuff of government is power, as Wilson says in chapter one. So what is where does government get its power? And this is where there's a little story, you could say, implicit in the Declaration's principles, and that Hobbes is explicit about in Locke, is uh, we have to, we ha we're surrounded by unlimited power and freedom over ourselves, but that's what leads to the insecurity of our rights. So to create government, all of us has to limit our powers, draw a boundary around our freedom, our rights. And then take that leftover freedom and power from that we're that we're kind of boundary drawing a boundary around ourselves and create a common pool. So the power that government wields is actually constructed out of that leftover power that we give up in order to secure ourselves through government. So that's what government is made of. It's made of 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 again that that ab that in our natural condition, absolute freedom and rights or, or liberty, we draw a boundary and what's left over, we, we kind of give that up to the common thing. So that's what government is. It's a common pooled power um, uh, to do in common what we cannot do individually. Now, how does government come into being? And here's where the, the Declaration's two remaining principles, consent and the ability to alter or establish come from. If we are equal, then no human being naturally rules another human being, except for parents over children. Um, no natural kings, no divine right of kings, no aristocratic class. So if you think about it, government can only come into being uh, uh, through two ways. Terror, compulsion, fear, or consent. What's the difference between those two things? Um if you are terrorized, if somebody holds a knife or a gun to your head and says, uh, obey me or I'll kill you, think about this. We understand that the chief power we have as human beings, we have all kinds of powers that other animals have, like running and, in my case, running fast away from a threat. Um, but we understand we have reason. So on one level, to say that by nature gives us the power to reason means we make the decisions in our life by thinking them through. Now, if somebody holds a gun to your head, a Stalin or a Hitler uh, or whatever, a tyrant, uh, and says, obey me or I'll kill you, in a sense, he is treating you like an animal. He's destroying your human nature to reason over yourself. So government can come into being through force and fraud. Perhaps most of the governments in human life have come in that way. But obviously, you can also agree to be ruled by an entity that you agree to be ruled by, where you're persuaded by it. And that willing giving up of your absolute freedom is called consent. If you agree for me to rule you because I've shown that you will benefit from it, then I haven't hold a gun to your head. I've asked you to think about it and agree to it. And think about this. If nature makes us equally free, and we're all natural rulers, if we freely agree to give up our absolute unlimited powers, then we haven't destroyed ourselves as a being. So government can come into being through force and fraud, or it can come into being by consent. And as you're going to see when we turn to Diamond on Friday, that's what Diamond argues the core definition of liberty is in the, in the Declaration about Liberty. That's why governments legitimately can only arrive, arise through consent. Because when a government is erected out of the consent of the governed, it doesn't destroy the nature of human beings as free and rational beings. It persuades you and therefore uses your natural reason 
to construct a government that secures your rights. So we've seen why we need government, how it comes into being, and how it's constructed. And if you consent to construct it to secure your rights, and when you see it doesn't do that anymore, that leads to the Declaration's last statement, that when government becomes destructive of those rights, the very purpose it came into being to secure them, then the people have the right to alter it and abolish it, which is exactly what the Americans were doing. Now, um, there are what I like to consider two fundamental problems, uh, problematic aspects of the Declaration's teaching. And you'll see these tensions or these problems, these two giant questions about the Declaration's teaching reverberate through our, our life because the tensions are embedded in the principles themselves. So what are the uh, the two natural problems or questions that immediately come up with the Declaration's understanding of government, its purposes, and its limits. One, we have to give up freedom to secure our freedom. Think about that. In order to preserve our freedom and to escape from the chaos that unlimited freedom generates, we have to give up our freedom. The moment your mind starts to think about that, you see the natural question creeping behind you. How much freedom do you have to give up in order to remain free? How many of our rights must we give up in order to secure our rights? The moment you let that question play in your mind, the moment you see there's no easy answer to that question. For instance, in a natural disaster, a hurricane or tornado or an earthquake or, or forest fire, whatever, uh, people declare natural uh, martial law, which is military rule. Now, most people wouldn't stand for that exertion of authority during most times, but in the time of a natural disaster, or for uh, we have that question unfolding right in front of us right now with the COVID, uh, the pandemic. Some people argue that, that the government's deprivation of freedom uh, is too much and it, it, it's excessive. Yet some people think that the government should be stronger in, in compelling people to wear masks or telling or shutting the economy down. My point is not to adopt either one of those positions or support them, but to see the tension. The only way we can remain free is to limit our freedom. Therefore, it's a natural question in American life. And this is why we have profound agreements about these things. You can't escape the question. If the only way you can remain free is to give up some of your freedom, then it is always a question, how much freedom must we give up to remain free? And there is no simple, easy answer to that question. Much of it depends on circumstances. Much of it depends on the nature of the people in front of you. The second great question, which I've already talked about on Monday, and you're going to see this is the question that leads first to the Articles of Confederation and finally to the Constitution, is government means creating an artificial amount of power that we give up from ourselves. And it just doesn't mean creating an artificial pool of power. Government means giving that power to a certain set of people then who govern us. So it means, by the way, that government naturally means an inequality of power. Even if you live in a radical democracy where technically everybody rules themselves, some people are going to have to run things and therefore will actually exercise more power. Um, and so on one level, the second great question is, is we create government and give it power. How much power should government have? And that's what I already suggested on Monday. If you don't have government or have government without enough power or too weak, then rights fall back into their original condition of insecurity. You have anarchy. Nobody's safe. So government has to be strong enough to draw boundaries and keep our rights secure by enforcing those limits and protecting against thieves or, 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 or people that would assault us or something. So on one level, Creating the power of government, we have to give government enough power to end the natural anarchy and insecurity that we live in. Yet, here's the problem. The cure can be worse than the disease. Um, what happens if government has so much power that it becomes like gods over, over animals, mortals? And, and, and your rulers, then, it turns out, can do anything they want. Then the very instrument you've created to secure your rights becomes the very thing that's destructive of your rights. When government has too much power, we call that, as I mentioned on Monday, tyranny. So as you're going to see, the declaration points to a situation where the mean between two extremes is the definition of good government. Government has to be strong enough to protect us, powerful enough to protect us, but not so powerful 
that it destroys the very rights. Somehow, that you've got to create a government that's strong enough to govern, but not strong enough to tyrannize. You're going to see that that unfolds into the great question of the American founding and culminates in the great achievement of the Constitution, which we will see next week.